Frequencies podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Dempsey, and I'm joined today by John Lukovich. He runs the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast. He's the author of Instinctual Drives and the Enneagram, and he's the co-founder of the Enneagram School, as well as being a painter, a teacher, seemingly a world traveler. I was checking out your travels to Egypt. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited to have you as a guest. So thank you for joining today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. This is a human design podcast, but I really have people from all walks of life. I've had scientists, I've had um, different, just people from different fields that I find interesting. And Enneagram was definitely one of my first loves. Um, long before human design, I was, I was very deep in Enneagram as well as Jungian typology. And so those are both um, systems that have personally helped me in a lot of ways. And then your name came up from a few different avenues for me. I have a friend who follows your work on Enneagrammer. So that's, I know, one of one of your avenues. And, um, and then our mutual friend, Amara, actually, she mentioned you and, uh, and I was like, oh, I, I've, I've heard of this guy. I keep hearing about him. So I reached out, I, I saw some comments you'd posted, very, very astute comments. And I'm always happy to see people furthering the work as well. I mean, you're, you're really doing a lot of your own research and a lot of your own uh, contributions, which is really exciting. Thanks. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Mara is one of my closest friends, and uh, we're in the Gurdjieff work together. And uh, yeah, she's done my human design reading several times, and I kind of get it. Uh, but you know, the like the left cross of the upper level of the whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of technical terms there. A lot of yeah, I'm like right angle on incarnation that. cross and all these. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'll just share your body graph here that I, I have ready and uh yeah being a one three projector on the cross of the four ways uh i guess my viewers will have more insight into that but yeah and i don't even often talk about human design in these i mean we can talk about anything i have a couple notes i've taken okay. a few notes of just like things we could talk about but really um i mean frequencies to me is just an excuse to connect with people that i'm interested in uh, connecting with and you're you're definitely one of those people so I really cool. appreciate having you on here. Um, but yeah, I also, you know, I've done a, a YouTube channel for a while and it's mostly human design now, but I used to do Enneagram and it still comes up and I'm, I'm still considering doing an introductory Enneagram class at some point. Do you have any advice for somebody who's just getting into Enneagram where they might go to learn it? I mean, I guess probably Enneagrammer or the Enneagram school would be a good, I know those are yes. two different ventures, but. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's it's a complicated question because there's so much Enneagram content out there, and despite how much content there is, a lot of the content is just recycled definitions and frankly stereotypes and um, kind of caricatures of the typology that just kind of gets passed down and some of the some of the language changes a little bit, but it's mostly the same. Um, kind of understanding with a lot of the same assumptions brought to it. And so like what I mean by that is that there's a lot of conceptual drift in the Enneagram uh, where, you know, uh, people, you, you, you describe a certain type and people get a certain type um, in their head. You know, they imagine what that type looks like and then, then they apply that and then, to, you know, they're like, they, they might type somebody or type themselves usually inaccurately typed because the Enneagram is mostly unconscious. And then they start teaching or reporting their experience based on the wrong type. And so um, the work we've done with like the Enneagrammer.com website and the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, my friends, Emeka Okorafor, David Gray, Alexander Arroyo Acevedo, and Joseph Simone uh, do the podcast and then to the website. So there's a lot of good material there. And I'm, uh, you know, I think that the best book on the Enneagram out there for, for beginner is wisdom of the Enneagram by Risa and Hudson. But, um, I just like, I got to the point where people were asking me the same question all the time. So I'm working on my book that I can just be like, this is the book I think you should read, which is <laughs> going to be my, my, my take on the Enneagram along with, um, you know, there's like, uh, 
new insights about how people type and think about types and think about personality that you know now that now the enneagram's more widespread that we didn't have like you know 30 years ago when the last kind of major enneagram books were written so you know there's there's a thing about how we understand and hold the typology as like a construct that i want to include in there too so uh enneagrammer.com or um there's some object relation episodes on my podcast that i that are good to start with with my friend courtney smith Mm. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited uh, personally to, to dig into both of those because I do like to keep up in different approaches. And then also just besides um, Enneagram, I'm interested in, I know it sounds kind of dry, but questions of taxonomy, typology, things like this. And I actually used to go into this a lot with the guy from talking with famous people. So he would go into a I, I was right there in uh, 2017 in the beginning of some of the objective personality work with, with uh, oh, yeah. Dave Powers and, and Shannon Renee down in Portland. I lived up in Seattle, so I would drive down to visit them and kind of talk with them. And um, we definitely disagreed about a lot of things, but I was fascinated by it because I had already done a lot of my own work on Jungian typology. I, I didn't call it Myers-Briggs. I mean, obviously it is, it is related to that, but basically mm-hmm. very much in the... Um, like von Franz classic kind of classical Jungian school. And I'd already developed my own subtyping, which concorded with them. I actually have an unfinished book I call the temperament stack because I was already doing work on the subtypes by temperaments. And I still think that's useful for cross-referencing objective personality animal stack, what they mm. use. Now, I don't know if you, how far you've gone into that or if that's something that you observe at all or... Yeah, That's what's... another thing that basically like all my friends and everybody around me is super into and somehow it doesn't quite penetrate. I find that the animals thing is pretty useful. Um, I think I'm like a T-I-S-E and then I'm consume sleep. Yeah, you would be lead consume play. then. That makes sense. Yeah. And missing play. Yeah, I'm also a missing play. Well, see, I identify as missing play. They believe I. it's one of my top animals, but... But I mean, I, I've done a lot of videos on that. And um, yeah, for any listeners who aren't familiar with this, this is the objective personality system. And it's somewhat convoluted and complicated. And it's, it doesn't help that the two founders, while being lovely people, are kind of in this echo chamber that doesn't really allow open conversation. Because like you were talking about with the conceptual drift in Enneagram, you start with these buckets and you want to fill them with the right data. And that's why as difficult as it can be to make interesting observations with astrology or human design, at least there's no debate about what your type is because at least, you know, you have your, your birth date and that's it. And then you can fill that bucket and you can argue over it. And it's kind of like the blind men arguing over the elephant and one saying it's bendy and one saying it's strong and whatever, because they're touching different parts of it. But at least you're talking about an elephant. The difficulty with Enneagram or objective personality is kind of the double difficulty that I will characterize what it's like to have missing play, but then they don't agree with me that I'm missing play. And they're like, no, Jonah, you're very playful. And I'm like, well, well, thank you. I've worked very hard to be, to give the appearance of being very playful. So, but it (laughs) it gets, it gets difficult in that way. But one thing I really liked about, um, and you know, I've kind of been out of the Enneagram world for quite some time, but then I have some friends in their 20s who are very into Enneagram and they're all about Enneagrammer and they're huge super fans of your podcast. They're going to go nuts when I I tell them I, you know, interviewed you. And one of the things I got- Shout out to Jonah's friends. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. uh, Madison and uh, Ren and, but you know, one one of the things I I got from them is first of all, that tri-type is pretty well accepted now, right? You use Mm tri-type and that because tri-type has gained in popularity and become accepted, there's been a realization that actually um, what you call them attachment types, right? That the three, six, nine are actually way more common. I mean, it's always kind of been known those are the common types, but it's actually like 10 times more common and that a lot of people are mistyping because they simply have one of the non-attachment type fixes and they think that's their primary, but it's not. It's just some part of their character or even it's a wing or something like that. So so that to me was, I mean, I completely support that and it also um it also validates my own observations that i had never really put together in that way but it's like oh yeah oh yeah i'm really glad that people are kind of kind of just disentangling these things and
and getting a lot clearer because it's going to really help to take a lot of those false positives away from what it actually is um, to, to be a type. Now, I did want to mm-hmm. say um, something that I used to enjoy and I'd be interesting. I mean, it's hard to reduce things, but it's also it takes a great talent to take something complex and make it simple. And it can be kind of nice to make it simple. So one way that I used to teach Enneagram was with I'm OK, you're OK statements where you would just say these are like fundamental triggers like like um you know, um, I, I mean, I guess an example, well, it's, it's been actually interesting to raise this question to you then. If, if it's possible, just as an introduction, if we could play this game of I'm okay, you're okay for the types. So I'll give an example, like Enneagram one, I'm okay if I'm right, you're okay if you're right. Or I'm okay if I'm perfect, you're okay if you're perfect. I don't know if it's possible to condense it or if you have one that you would correct that and say it's like it's not about being right it's actually about blank or or something like that but or like for two i would often say i'm okay if i'm being flattered you're okay if you're flattering me now that's not a very flattering thing to say about twos but that is a way of characterizing trying to get the self-esteem from the approval of others now obviously there are many approaches i love the object relations approach i love all these different ones but just kind of when you're first introducing any of them people are asking just to kind of have some yardstick fully understanding that um it's not the whole story. So I don't know if that's... Yeah. No, I, I I hear you. I'm not... Nothing's quite coming to me about the I'm okay, you're okay. But, um, you know, I think that my friend Josh Levine, who's the, who co-founded the Anywhere School with me, his he has a really beautiful and uh, uh, just very clear way that he has kind of c- combined object relations with the centers, the body, the heart, and mind, and kind of, you know, a three by three grid that really gets at their complexity while really like, uh, like, you know, a blowgun dart to the neck of what the types are doing. And so, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm struggling with the, I'm okay, you're okay kind of a thing, just because I can find with all the instinctual drives and trifix, like an enormous amount of exceptions. And, um, but you know, so if, if you're asking me for like a real kind of condensed, condensed. No, no, I think text. object relations is a wonderful approach, and it was interesting to me. Um, yeah, I saw. I think I saw the 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 nine grid you're kind of talking about, or uh, I mean, uh, um, I should have looked at that before our our chat here. But um, yeah, I know also like Hornevian. There's a Hornevian approach. There's obviously, I guess, I guess Kleinian is the more traditional object relations approach, and there's there's ways of kind of understanding like um i guess is it hornevian where where six is double compliant four is double withdrawal eight is double i don't know if the word is aggressive or um assertive yeah yeah exactly yeah. assertive yeah. Is, is that is that hornevian then and and is object relations a little bit different from that or object yeah i believe that's those are the hornevian groups that you're referring to and uh object relations is a little different and so um Object relations is the idea that our personality forms in relationship with our early environment, specifically our caregivers, and that when we are relating as young children, infants with our caregivers, we are not only holding an object image, a kind of a impression of our caregivers, but also a subject image, an, an impression or sense of ourselves. And between the subject and object, ourselves and our caregivers, which that object image gets projected onto our environment and other people. But between ourselves and our caregivers is what's called an affect, which I think of as like an emotional conviction. It's not like emotion itself, but it's sort of where our emotions are hung on. And so um, there are three dominant object relational affects, which are attachment, frustration, and rejection. And these are three ways we deal with certain uh, misses in our early development. I actually think we're probably born as our type. That's just my whatever. I, I can hold do a whole side argument, whatever. But but regardless of whether we're born with our type or not, we feel and experience misses in our early environment and our upbringing. And we deal with them in the style of our type and we interpret them in the style of our type. And so when you take uh, these three affects, 
and you combine them with the centers of intelligence. The centers of intelligence are the body, heart, and mind, and the reason there's a triangle in the middle of the Enneagram, one of the reasons, is that they're linking body, heart, and mind as the three um, faculties with which we know ourselves and have a human experience, right? Through sensation, through feeling, and through mental perception or thought. And the body, the heart, and mind are uh, the way they are related to one another makes up our Enneagram type. That's why there's nine types is because there are three body types, three mental types, three emotional types. But, you know, it, like I, for example, I'm a type four, which is an emotional type. But that means that I identify with the emotional center, but I bring in thought and um, introspection to reinforce specific emotional states to reinforce my identification. So all your centers are work in a type. But when it comes to a body type, it's like, what, what, what the hell is a body type? Um, body type is somebody who, uh, you know, when we're born, we are, uh, like, I just had a niece that was born, and first, first time uh, uncle power. And, you know, new babies are just sensation. You know, they're just, they, they have no awareness of anything except just, like, sensation, right? There's no boundary or inner outer. And so the three body types are different strategies, a rejection, a frustration, or an attachment strategy for getting what the body center is looking for, which is a good holding environment. Good holding environment is like a psychological term for, uh, you know, the sum total of the environment, like how our caregivers are relating to us, but also that our environment is not stressed out and um, that our sensations are good, basically. And so um, when you have a attachment uh, body type, like a nine, Attachment body type is a type that is open to their environment. As an adult, you're still unconsciously hoping that the environment works itself out so that you get the right kind of holding. And the nine thinks unconsciously, if I you know, go with the flow, if I adapt myself, if I don't make too much of a, a fuss, if I don't blow up too much, um, eventually things will kind of flow in the right direction. And as a result, I kind of give up on myself. I kind of space out for my own needs and wants and I feel unseen and I feel unmet by the environment because I'm not actually putting myself forward. Uh, the frustration uh, body type is in this milieu of sensation. I'm, there's, there's something gets in just like with the nine, like the environment gets in, but it's like irritating to me. And I need to purify it. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't relax unless this agitating contaminant in my environment is somehow fixed or purified and so my ego activity goes into fixing and purifying and it's kind of like i as an adult i kind of always need something to be reacting to and purifying so i'm i'm looking for something you know i'm always looking to be good to be just to be moral to be reforming to have some kind of mission or something i'm perfecting and then for eight uh their rejection type and so uh rejection types it's like the environment is not giving me what i need so i'm going to provide it for myself and which means i'm going to actually reject certain sensations i'm experiencing and kind of make my own little environment where my own will i can like flex my will without any um, encumbrance or pushback and i just cut myself off from anything that makes me basically like uncomfortable i just eliminate boom and so eights tend to be very big energy because they're providing them they're i'm the holding environment you know like it's fucking me and pushing you out and so there's a lot of control there's a lot of uh big energy they can be very commanding they can be seemingly they get the projection a lot of having no insecurities and and being like without vulnerabilities which is absolutely not true they're just very good at not showing it and so very big energy so that's like the body center with the object relations and oh, I, you know i'm saying a lot i want to pause but i can keep going on to that. no no that that is a wonderful description and it is kind of coming back to me i mean i i did study some object relations years ago and then of course i i realized that the attachment um, types are so called because of object relations, but I, I hadn't really made the connection and the now i kind of have this formula and that is um yeah, it does seem like a, a really wonderful um, way of approaching it. I actually, a number of years ago, I worked with a Lacanian psychoanalyst named Tomas Gill, and he actually wrote an essay called Enneagram from Fundamental Principles. And I remember we went into object relations then as well. Of course, he was coming from a, the perspective of Jacques Lacan, who's a much more um, surrealist kind of approach, really, really interesting French psychoanalyst. And 
it had a similar a similar way of of just taking these kind of fundamental principles and really breaking it down though because even though Lacan was not an object relations yeah, you know, analyst or theorist, he did engage with that a lot, and he actually did did write a lot about object relations and kind of distinguished his thought from from Klein and others. But um, that's just a really really wonderful way of describing it, and I think bringing it back to those fundamentals can avoid a lot of the superficial generalizations and kind of caricatures where people say, oh, you're an eight, so you're a tough guy, or oh, you're a one, you're a goody two-shoes. It's like, well, there's a reason that they get seen as a goody two-shoes. You, you kind of see where the caricature came from, but you don't then mistake somebody who's acting like a goody two-shoes from in one way for right. one, you actually look for the deeper motivation behind that. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Right, yeah. To, to what you're saying about uh, when you introed uh, me about like, how we're how myself and my my friends are approaching Enneagram is like trying to look at it from the point of view of psychological structure and how traits emerge from that structure rather than looking at traits and trying to determine type because I feel like that is where people uh, when they're trying to understand the Enneagram and understand themselves uh, make a lot of mistakes because traits are in, very very interpretive I mean you're doing interpretation all around but like if I say uh, you're sensitive and creative. Basically, any type could be that, but in the kind of uh, mainstream enneagram, so to speak, there's a sensitive creative type, right? And, th and you go, oh, that must be me. Or, you know, so it kind of gets reduced to cartoons and caricatures, and that cartoon caricature um, stance or that that perspective does not really like. And you know, this is my thing: is like, look at the suffering. Right, like the, each type is a, its own special version of suffering, and it's doing something and making itself miserable in a special way, and um, and so you know when you think about as a nine, we talk about that attachment openness to the environment that attachment represents. A lot of nines, uh, you know, they don't know they're doing this, and when they start to see it. You know, it's just, it's like so much grief. I thought this is how I can just like survive and get along in the world. And like, I just be open and I try not to push too many buttons or whatever. And I'm thinking eventually, like, I don't even realize what I'm giving up in order to try to th get what I think I need. And how much of myself I'm actually not looking at, not um, giving voice to, not exploring, not developing, not individuating. Because early in life, I got this message from either myself from my environment or both that there's a certain way I I can't show up if I'm going to be acceptable and loved and connected to people. Yeah, I've heard nine say their greatest fear is getting canceled or getting rejected from a community or it's kind of like they're tiptoeing in a in a way of um but but also uh, I I like that you go straight to the suffering because I didn't tell you my I'm okay, you're okay for the four, which is I'm okay if I'm in pain, you're okay if you're in pain, because that means we're not fake, you know? Fake is the worst thing in, in authenticity. But I say that in jest also because I understand yeah. that not, that fours are not here to be in pain. It's more like like I, I'm with you. It's, it's actually kind of nice when you are... Um, you know, it's so funny. It's like I do a lot of human design where we run into the same problem of all these overgeneralizations and characterizations and people asking the wrong questions and asking questions that really can't be answered in the human design body graph, asking questions that just won't won't actually yield any general results because it's not a general thing. It's up to the person and so on. And so I'm always having to be careful to kind of don't caricature and so on. But then I talk to other people who've been in human design a long time and we actually get to kind of let our hair down and yeah, then yeah. make a bunch of jokes and actually use all the caricatures and laugh about it with the knowledge that that's not the whole story. And so it is kind of, it's, it's a funny, uh, it's almost like I have to be so careful all the time not to perpetuate stereotypes, but then I also get to enjoy the stereotypes as long as we understand them in context and know that it is just kind of making fun of ourselves and not really, uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, our podcast is very annoying because we ruthlessly make fun of the types all the time. And, you know, like, I'm all about stereotypes, but as long as they're the right stereotypes, like yeah. our types yeah, are exactly. stereotypes, but it's like, you know, it's like if you're like, oh, I'm a people pleaser, I must be a two. Twos aren't people pleasers. Nines are people pleasers. And so let's yeah. make fun of 
uh yeah. the way nines people please versus the way twos are like gonna assert their love into your <laughs> your heart you know twos are gonna aggressively help you and then make you owe them for it <laughs> sorry i don't want to say owe you for it and you didn't even know you wanted that help and yeah. you didn't actually you know no here it is well, no, and twos, I mean, I have a, I have a friend who I, I am convinced is a two. I know there's a lot of false positives for two, but I am convinced he's a two. And, you know, someone might mistake him for an eight or something. Well, obviously they are connected, but he'll say things like um, he's in business and he'll say, you know what, Jonah, all business is is fucking and getting fucked. That's the whole thing. You know, and he'll be this like really tough, gruff kind of guy. But, but he actually is so like his song, the song of the two is my wife doesn't appreciate all I do for her. My kids don't appreciate all I yeah. do for them. Nobody appreciates all I do. And he's the first one to show up with his pickup truck and move all your shit. And the first one to bring the chicken soup. And so, I mean, it's kind of like he doesn't look like this kind of, oh, he doesn't really look like a helper. He looks like this really gruff kind of tough guy kind of right. aggressive and all these things but that's it and then he will you know and then and then uh he'll kind of be really pissed off that he wasn't appreciated or recognized for anything he does he's like i just do so much for people all the time and nobody nobody appreciates me and it's this whole this whole story but i mean even that's of course a caricature because i'm sure you can find twos who who have gone through that and that that's the difficulty with the um, jungian typology as well because and one of the reasons i love of Jungian typology is it it gives you an orientation the orientation toward the inferior function which is the dispreferred or least preferred function um, which is essentially the door to the unconscious into what is most numinous or profound for a person um, numinous being a word that Jung uses to kind of mean imbued with some sort of you know innate sacredness or sense of profundity and so it's really funny because you end up with a sensing type who like I know a guy in his 40s is a sensing type and he, he came to me one day and had this really profound vision in his dream and all I could figure out as an intuitive from talking to him about it was that the vision in his dream was that dreams are important and that dreams actually have messages and to me as an intuitive that's something that's obvious and not profound at all and kind of like boring and you know but for me it's like i mailed this letter and it's like who cares you mailed a letter no but you don't understand i went to the post office i, I used a stamp like like it's really profound for me to, to have done something in the physical world you know I, I didn't get my my driver's license until uh very late in life i was 25 and i was so proud to like finally be driving and then you have you know sensing types who are driving at 12. so i mean i, I but i guess i'm just saying that you can't really generalize that intuitives aren't going to drive or intuitives aren't going to this or that. It's more just like an orientation where certain things in life, they're going to, are going to be more important or less important, more salient. They're going to stand out. And I really like Jungian typology merely for its orienting effects. I don't think, I think a lot of systems are overburdened and kind of doing double or triple duty people are trying to make them do more than they can do and so even something like objective personality is really like i think that they would actually benefit from learning enneagram and from trying to understand enneagram because i do think enneagram gets at a completely different level than the orientation of cognitive processing that young like okay you might find some correlations maybe there's certain types that happen to be overrepresented underrepresented this and that but overall they're talking about different things and what they're really talking about um it's almost as different as uh well yeah it's 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 cognitive processing versus somehow Enneagram seems so much deeper and almost like matters of the soul like will someone actually develop or grow as a person um, something that George R. R. Martin said that I really like, and he lives here in, in town and he's always around in you know, Santa Fe here. And he said, when asked what he wrote about, he said he writes about the human heart at odds with itself, the only thing worth writing about. And I thought about it and I realized the best drama does have a character where up until they make that decision, you don't know what decision they're going to make. You're rooting for them to make one decision and you're either triumphantly sharing in the joy that they made that decision or you're 
full of sorrow that they didn't, that they were standing at the precipice and they almost made that growth and they almost made that next step kind of in the growth of the soul for, for lack of a better term. And then they didn't and they failed. And it, that's what Enneagram speaks to, to me. And that's not even something that human design can speak to. I mean, Enneagram, I don't see any, any correlation whatsoever between Enneagram and a human design body graph. And that's something I looked at, I looked for quite a bit. And ultimately I just found a bunch of um, twins and you do find twins where they have the same personality type, but you also find, I'm not sure if this research has been done with Enneagram. There, there's kind of two schools here. Some people think twins, that identical twins have the same personality type, but it seems like non-identical twins at least don't. It may be true that identical twins do. I mean, I guess it makes sense that they would if they really are identical, but, but the non-identical twins can have the exact same human design body graph and be totally different personality types. So I, I also, uh, uh, you know, I also um, think that the personality type is something that you're born with, but I, I actually even go a step further. I think it's something you're reborn with. I've actually thought a lot about this and I, I never really got too into past lives or anything like that until the last couple of years. Uh, but I do, I do believe it's, it's clear that there is some kind of incarnative process that we go through to me anyway. And, um, I, I don't think personality type changes. In fact, I think that might be a way that you can identify past lives more accurately, or at least kind of an extra check, an extra triangulation. Because I, I, th I thought a lot about that, and I really think personality is something, I mean, in a way, it's almost um, something we're stuck with, you know? It's almost like, like we, we might in our fantasy like to imagine that we get to see from every perspective, but actually we are seeing from our corner. We don't have some God's eye view from above. And so, um, yeah, I know that's kind of a lot of different things there, but I, I just want to appreciate Enneagram for its depth of analyzing these very core central human issues about matters of the human soul at odds with itself and matters of are we going to grow or are we going to regress to our comfort zone that, as you mentioned, leads to our own suffering. And these are the kind of, this is the area where I, where I think nothing can replace Enneagram that, that I've found. I've surveyed a lot of different systems. I've gone into a lot of different typologies and mystical systems. And it seems to me that, you know, Enneagram really is singular in its ability to characterize these fundamental human dilemmas. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think that's why I've obsessively stuck with it because, you know, I agree with you that your type doesn't change and what, can change is your quality of presence you know some kind of inner life that is interfacing with but not identified with your personality you know it's like that sort of sufi saying of being in the world but not of it it's how do you uh very like recognize your very limited perspective because as you're saying you don't get the whole view at all you know your view no matter how hard you try, is always going to be deeply, deeply limited. And so how do you make use of the machine you have? How do you make sure that the machine has uh, a pilot or a, an operator home instead of it just flailing out and just doing its own thing? And so, yeah, I, there's something about the Enneagram um, that, you know, I don't quite have the language for it, but... In, in my view, it's it's working directly with your inner senses, your, you know, sensation, feeling, and perception, you know, the, the, your, your experience of your, the, the, the doors of experience of your own inner world, and changes what you think and how you experience body, heart, and mind if you're able to work with it, because in the language of uh, Gurdjieff, who, from whom the Enneagram symbol comes from not the personality but the symbol um you know says that our personality is made up of the wrong work of body heart and mind and so what is it what, what does that mean and how do you identify the wrong work and then what is how do you do the right work and so i think enneagram for anything i've come across has been the most potent in like addressing that and addressing um like you know, 
not what it means to be human, but something about what is this machine that we are supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? I absolutely do. And um, I think it also is perhaps the most differentiated and developed and elaborated system that exists within the context of a number of spiritual traditions that do engage with this tripartite division of body, heart, mind. Interestingly, the Theosophical Society, they have the distinction between, um, well, they have five levels. They have the personality and the soul, which in human design we call the personality and the design, kind of the unconscious. But then they also have the physical, the mental, and the um, kind of emotional slash spiritual. And so it's interesting to think of Oftentimes the word spirit is so vague and is so conceptual, but even to actually just make it more concrete by by discussing the spiritual as the emotional or conflating those two intentionally um, instead of trying to keep them apart and trying to say that there's some sort of conceptual spirituality that's different from the actual lived life of the emotions. I, I think it's actually, it, it behooves us to see the emotional quality of, of the spirit in that sense. But um, in human design, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share your, your body graph again. And I know a few people out there have actually done some Enneagram human design research, not trying to predict the Enneagram from the body graph, because again, you have people with the identical body graph, but very different personalities, but just looking for correlations. And one of the interesting things is you actually do have a triangle. You have the spleen, the ajna, and the solar plexus, and they actually do form a triangle, and they are the three awareness centers, and the spleen is the physical awareness. It's likened to um, millions of little noses and ears and tongues inside the body that report back if the body's poisoned, if it's hungry, if it's sleepy, if it's this, if it's that, you know, it's kind of the, um, the lymphatic system and, uh, the, the cells in the body that are really monitoring everything going on in the body. So it's the physical awareness. Then you have the Ajna, which is the conceptual awareness center. And then you have the solar plexus, which is the emotional awareness. Now, the, the extra layer that human design gives is that when you're undefined, you automatically bring awareness to that because you're open and receptive. So it's kind of funny, like, like here we have an undefined Ajna, which is an awareness center about um, conceptualization and knowing. And what this says is that you're actually here to bring awareness to that. Someone who has a defined Ajna may be very fixed in what they know and very certain in their opinions. And they don't know how they know. They don't even think about how they know. They just have this conviction. But then in, in your case, you're actually equipped to bring a lot of awareness to that and to say, okay, well, let's, let's look at why you know that, or let's look at how you know that, or how do you think that, or kind of bringing, bringing awareness to that. Similarly with, with the emotions, someone who's defined emotionally is going to really just be seeing the world, experiencing the world through the color of glasses of where their emotional wave is. So they're going to be so excited on top of the world. And then later they're going to be down in the dumps and, and wherever they are in that wave, they're not really bringing awareness to it. It is awareness, but it's not self-reflected awareness. It's not awareness of being aware in your case, because you're open here, you have this tremendous capacity to take in the other's emotional field and to notice it. And in fact, um, it, you know, you can probably synchronize to it pretty easily. It can be really discombobulating if you have two people in your, in your field and one of them is really high and one of them is really low, right? And it's kind of like, who do I synchronize to or how do I do this? But, but just having, having that openness there, it, it really shows that you can bring a lot of awareness there. And then where you're, yeah. where you're defined, this is what we would call the life force energy. And this is really you feel most alive when these channels are operating, when they're working. You actually have this whole stream here from the, this channel up to this channel. This is all part of the same circuitry. It's called the stream of smell. And it's about, uh, well, obviously the cognitive sense of smell, but, but more symbolically, um, the smell of money, the smell of success, being able to smell a rat. It's about, it's tribal and it's about... Um, really being able to improve and transform your material circumstances and, 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 you know, those around you 
of, of for those those people in your life for the better. Um, very entrepreneurial, very creative. This is a creative channel. It makes sense. You're a painter, but well, but of course we can't I hope generalize. The money part. I hope the money part comes true at some point. <laughs> it should. You have the. Uh, this is the love of success, and this we nickname this the channel of capitalism. And um, for people to have <laughs> this, I just say there is no shame whatsoever in being rich, and you you know you deserve reward. In fact, not everyone has a defined ego. Of course, we all have these different body graphs, and when you have a defined ego, your ability to be rewarded for your hard work is directly related to your vitality. So there are people out there for whom it's totally fine to do things without reward. But in your case, it actually is a life force energy where, you know, you publish your book, you do all that hard work. Well, time to go on vacation, time to go to a nice restaurant, time to get a massage, go to the spa. Like you need to be rewarded or else the life force energy itself starts to dwindle. And so I, if anything, I think human design shows us where our life force energy is and what vitalizes us. And it can show us things about, um, really just uh, as I mean, I think life is kind of the, the, the key there. It's showing you a map of, of where your life force energy is. And it really shows us the diversity of life force energy that some people are going to be really satisfied by work and the work is its own reward. Other people are going to really become more vital through the success of achieving something and then being rewarded for that achievement, working once, profiting forever versus working on the treadmill, you know? So there's just a lot of little nuances like that. But um, being a projector, uh, one thing I can say is that's the youngest type. It's the newest type. And the projectors really are here to be our guides into the future because we're moving out of an era where every problem was fixed by just building a new solution. We're kind of moving out of a new deal era of just let's build our way out of it. And we're moving into an aware, into an era of awareness where it's more about the mastering of systems and the understanding of very complex situations and how to use what we already have more efficiently, how to retrieve things that were lost from the past, how to, I mean, all of these different skills that are needed. And your type is, is the type that is that is really here to um, to master those systems and to guide others with your awareness, which seems like what you are doing in your teaching and in your writing. Um, I hope so. <laughs> so absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, this is this is wonderful. So all I really had in my notes, um, I guess, a few things I wanted to bring up Egypt. So you you travel to Egypt? Is this something you do regularly, or something you? you feel close to? Do you, do you have family from there? Or is this more of like a spiritual connection? Maybe, maybe past yeah. lives in Egypt? Yeah. Um, I fucking love Egypt. Um, I, so I believe the Enneagram has roots in Egypt. I, and, I agree entirely. Yeah. I, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of foo foo woo woo kind of nonsense out there, but, um, Something called the Ennead of Heliopolis, which I don't think it's a one-to-one -one kind of correlation. I think it's, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, for anybody that's curious, it's the place to start. Um, so, yeah, I uh, I used to work for Russ Hudson as his assistant and very occasionally co-taught stuff with him. And he's um author of Wisdom of the Anywhere that I recommended at the top. And... Um, uh, I went, like, when I was assistant, I went with him once, uh, with John Anthony West, who is a, um, very controversial figure in Egyptology who, uh, brought, um, geologist to the Sphinx to date the Sphinx based on the water erosion patterns and who estimated that the Sphinx is far older than is commonly believed. This just so happened to also match up with, uh, stuff Gurdjieff said it happened to match up with uh, the fact that it is a lion's body it's an equinoctial marker lion's body and 
that the date that they proposed, 10,500 BC, roughly lines up when the equi the the equinox would be in the constellation of Leo and blah 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 blah. Yeah, I have actually studied and, some of that. Right, we're we're kind of entering into the age of Aquarius through the procession of the equinoxes. But if you go back in 2,000 year roughly segments, you go back to I mean, obviously the Piscean era, Christian era, and then. And then you go to Aries and the Ram and Taurus and the Bull and so on, and you, that makes that makes sense, yeah. So the idea is that what we know of ancient Egypt is perhaps a legacy of an older wisdom tradition, and not like an aliens thing, not any of that kind of stuff. But you know, regardless of it is or is not older or has older roots, um, Egypt itself is really misunderstood. And, you know, uh, I was I, reading a very mainstream Egyptologist, John Romer. I was uh, surprised to learn that a lot of the earliest Egyptologists were, um, you know, some of them were literal Nazis. Like they were in the, the, the early uh, 20th century and the time of like, like empire was just like, you know, big on their minds and stuff. And they were interpreting things through the lens of empire. And so not to say Egypt was perfect, not to say it was without its flaws, not to say whatever, it's a human thing. But um, the approach that John and Anthony West took to explore Egypt and the one that I take in my own way, um, not just regurgitating John Anthony West, is the symbolist approach. And he got this from Schwaller de Lubitz. And basically it's like, the Egyptians saw their civilization as an instrument for creating a connection between the spiritual worlds and the material worlds. And it saw all of life, all of the landscape, the movement of the sun, the rhythms of the Nile, um, the, the division between the deserts and the fertile land, um, the daily cycle, the yearly cycle, the cycle of the, the zodiac, uh, the you know, procession of equinoxes as a metaphor of spiritual death and renewal and sought to replicate these, you know, eternal or cosmic patterns from, uh, you know, the, the, the most highest shit that the Pharaoh did to the most common mundane activities. And just to give you an example of that, like, uh, when you go to ancient Egypt or you go to Egypt and you look at the old kingdom which is like the 2500 the old old part of uh pharaonic egypt uh you'll see in the tombs them th th you know them doing a lot of uh what looks to us like very mundane stuff like catching birds and spear hunt you know spearing fish and taking care of uh bulls and stuff like this and it's like man this is a weird fucking thing for a tomb to be full of it's so boring and um you know is the is the idea that the spirit would just be like chilling and like looking at these kind of mundane boring drawings like how dumb you know and and if you have no imagination that's what you conclude and then you make up a lot of bullshit about egypt based on or the egyptians based on that and so what you see though later in new kingdom which is like you know a, a thousand years later or more is these same gestures these same activities but performed by the gods and it's kind of like the implicit becoming explicit of these are gestures resonant with eternity right they are different uh almost you could say alchemical processes occurring on all levels all the time and that the idea and this isn't true in um you know in, in sufism and other you know traditions that sort of became esoteric uh, is that you are learning to uh, attenuate your inner eye, the eye of the heart, to seeing the operation of the divine in everything. And as such, what you're doing is you're putting yourself into a greater relationship with the divine operation and hopefully and ideally uh, becoming what a human being ought to become from this point of view of like, what does it mean to be uh, you know, as Gurdjieff said, a human being without quotation marks. And that all the artwork, the landscape, the pyramids, uh, everything was taken as a metaphor for this of just to, to bring us into, it's like, you know, not just like, oh, you go to, you go to church or temple or synagogue or whatever, whatever on, on, on one day a week or something, and then you do your normal stuff. 
sure there may have been services and things like this, but but it was like the whole civilization was this um, was a temple, and uh, again, it had its flaws, it had its bullshit, it had its whatever, just like anything else. But it produced, in my view, uh, the greatest art in human history. And, you know, just some of the tombs in the Valley of the, the Kings. And, I mean, even, like, what the fuck is a pyramid? Um, and I don't think they had, I you know, maybe they had special technology and sound, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But what I do think that they had was a capacity for a a highly developed and refined quality of attention and that they could work together and uh, you know like in the Gurdjieff work and the Enneagram what it's all really about is our transformation of our attention and inner life and you know I mentioned with Amara Amara and I are in this Gurdjieff work and we do these special Gurdjieff movements which um, you know they're like sacred dances but very complicated and you're you're moving your head at different times in your feet then you're different times in your arm and maybe saying something and what they're they're like active meditations and they really you require full attention no distraction from your usual personality and sometimes in doing something like that i feel like i can get, get a taste of um what it would be like to actualize my potential as a conscious being a more conscious being instead of distracted with all my normal bullshit and so I suspect that maybe not all everybody, maybe not the whole civilization, maybe only a certain limited people, but that that civilization was concerned with producing people who could um, have a higher development of being more consistently than is available in a modern world. Oh, ab absolutely, and I, I just love this this idea of these. Um works of art and architecture and so on that are imbued with so much meaning and significance, not just conceptually like, oh, I understand what that means. It's a, you know, this symbolist approach, but the symbolist approach in the way that when you were talking about Sufism, I thought of Henri Corbin, or I guess Henry Corbin, as, as we call him here, but um, just this, yeah, this right idea. Now. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. And I was kind of thinking of how, um, it, it is that when, when people hear symbolist or symbols, there's a way of interpreting them as stand-ins for concepts or, or just meaning, almost like you could look up what it means in a dictionary and, oh, that's all it is. But that actually, as Jung found and Hillman and, and Corban and, and others, um, there, there really is this tremendous power of the symbol to change the awareness and uh and to kind of this this transformation of the awareness that results in a changed relationship to to the life force and so it's like we kind of have this interesting binary where um in in you know human design we we talk a lot about no choice and some people interpret that to be fatalistic but i like to remind them there's no choice, but there's still a chance, meaning mm. you don't necessarily have a choice of what is coming, and it's not necessarily up to the mind to try to control the outcome. However, there is some sort of magic at work where the change of awareness does somehow change the trajectory. I actually had a YouTube commenter, uh, at Maram, who had a really interesting version of it. I was talking about no choice with the guest, and I was saying... I kind of said the kind of normal way that it's sometimes thought of as like, well, you're on a plane and the plane has its destination and you can't really control where it's going, but you can control a few things. You can get up and walk around and you can look out the window. This, that. He, he said, no, completely wrong. He said, actually, you can't even, you can't control anything. You can't control whether you blink or not. You can't control whether you breathe or not. There's no control whatsoever. But the awareness that is witnessing and experiencing the life can learn or not, and if it does learn, the plane lands somewhere else. And I loved that. It's like, it's not that it's some mm. sort of fatalistic fixed trajectory that we just have to give up in some sort of predetermined way. It's that the awareness itself is learning and it actually is very hopeful to me that, and so when we're talking about the use of attention, the correct use of attention, how attention is used and, and the intentionality of 
building architecture and art and lifestyles and cultural traditions and all of this to sort of be conducive to or to cultivate healthy use of attention. I mean, that's speaking my language right there. So I, I've never been to Egypt, but um, I have uh, a lot of affinity there. And uh, I've, always are, wanted, uh, yeah, I've always wanted to visit. Yeah. We're uh, with my friends, Lena and Diana. We're leading a trip in March. If you want to come, <sighs> EgyptRefeats.com. Uh, oh my word well uh <laughs> check it out Plug i am gonna out. yeah thank you i i want to i do want to check it out i um i have a lot of connection I, i'd want to go to akmim um uh, i i have a lot of i've had a lot of interesting synchronicities in my life and i also used to um well there, there was a period of my life where i was deep in in, in alchemical studies and so i studied a lot of the egyptian mm. alchemists and used to lecture at alchemical things and so on and uh so that would be a real treat for me to actually get to um experience in person what i'd only read about yeah oh i mean and the the felt sense impression of you know i before like i was not like in into egypt really until i like went but uh you know i grew up catholic and i remember you know, and, and I, I was into the occult in different, you know, in different ways, but I just always remember feeling like the king, the, like the inside of the Great Pyramid was like the weirdest and most mysterious place on Earth. And, uh, you know, just had this like kind of romantic sense. And then to actually be there and spend time in it and touch it and, you know, you feel like you're, uh, even if you don't get the whole download, you feel like you're you're being baptized into a certain um, into a certain stream of human uh, human creativity that feels really powerful and nothing's like it and it's just you know there's a lot of things like when you see a pyramid for example it's pretty easy to go wow that's a, a lot of fucking rocks well cool, cool and then you just kind of like you normalize it and go numb to it very quickly. But there are things like that in Egypt where if you can give it another moment of like like encountering rather than just letting things coat over as they usually do, you're a, you, you, I mean, you become just like kind of overwhelmed with how many kind of miraculous and spectacular things and uh, things that seemingly are a product of that kind of attention I was talking about, like. You know, you can go to, I don't know, uh, Paris and Rome and see some really amazing, beautiful things. But they're more about, like, the glory of the empire, right? They're, and the, 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 the ways they've brought wealth from other places. And, and with Egypt, not to say it didn't have any of that kind of stuff, but everything was a monument to the inner life. It somehow reflected it, and, you know, it wasn't like... It wasn't a country where a lot of other people from outside were coming through, so they had to flex on other other peoples. It was about kind of um, massaging and kneading and and vivifying this sense. And so, yeah, it's just it's just the the you can feel the remnants of the potency in the stones that are still there. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, I was already sold, but that just makes me even more <laughs> excited. So. Uh, I, I will look at, at the possibility of March and um, something interesting also. I mean, I, I've, I've had, yeah, I've had different times in my life where I've looked more or less into various areas and I started doing more research on Egypt last year after I met and became close with um, a, a person here who does a lot of work with the Akashic records and something that I had never really delved too into. I mean, I've always been open to the mystical and I've researched and studied various mystical traditions, occult traditions, and so on. Uh, growing up in Seattle, there's no shortage of different occult movements. But the Akashic Records was never something that was so captivating to me until I until I met this, this person who, I mean, it, it just takes an event, you know, you have to have someone who gets through to you or some connection or some reason. It's kind of like these things are around. There's great movies, you might not watch them, and then one day you watch it and go, oh my word, I've heard this is such a great movie, I just never... So that was kind of my experience. Like, I, I knew there was something interesting there. I think I just had to find the right person that I could connect with. And one thing that she told me from uh, being in a community of channels 
here in Santa Fe, would, f there were a few interesting things. One was that they would all independently do work and then compare notes because even very established people working in this area are so skeptical of what they themselves observe. Okay. And I thought, well, I mean, it makes sense. It's like you're kind of dealing with stuff that you're wondering if it's your imagination. You're wondering how much of it is something that you perceived versus something that like, are you perceiving um, an accurate image or a representation of something, or are you just making it up or are you tricking yourself this and that? So that was interesting that, that she would actually work with a group and they would independently do things and then kind of compare notes. But the other thing she said is that they agreed that most of the big, the builders of ancient Egypt and the kind of big names of ancient Egypt and so on had reincarnated as people that were actually drawn to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that the Ascension Temple at Luxor and some of these various classic mystical sites etherically moved, which is an interesting idea, almost that there's an etheric double of the landscape, and that they actually moved to Santa Fe of all places. And that was such a, a funny thing. But, um, you know, having lived here a few years now and having met some of the wild cast of characters in the community, uh, it, it might very well be true. I'll, I'll just say you're always welcome here as well. Anytime you've ever, have you ever been to the Southwest? Cool. Have you visited? I've never been. Yeah, no. I, I hadn't either. I was born in Boston. I grew up in Seattle. I lived in San Francisco. I mean, I, I lived in big cities and I never thought I would live in some ancient cow town, but I live on a <laughs> dirt road with, uh, you know, I, I love it here. And, um, and it's a really special place. So you're absolutely welcome to come here. Thank you. Have I, you ever... I'd love to. Yeah. Have you ever done any mystical, like Akashic Records work, anything like that? I know that's pretty far out, but uh, anything? Uh, I got a friend who uh, so has, so has suggested he would uh, pay for a session for me. I've never done anything like that. Um, you know, I've done a lot of, like, inner worky type of stuff and had, like, experiences of whatever, but not not anything that sort of fit into... Uh, a kind of psychic channel kind of thing and i'm 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 open to it i you know i uh some some people i i've i know not directly but through through a friend of have had uh very transformational experiences with something like akashic records so yeah i mean if well wants yeah to akashic I've, me i'm down <laughs> and I'll just say, well, if, if you come to Santa Fe, you'll you'll definitely meet some people doing that kind of thing. But um, I'll just say uh, it's a, it's kind of a funny, maybe reversal of what we would assume. But I actually think there's a benefit to not being too curious. I mean, curiosity is great, but there's also something to be said. Like, I really enjoy when I meet somebody who's not into human design at all, and I know them for a long time, and there's no interest, and they're not curious, and then something in their life comes up that leads them to kind of want to know something, but it's not a, it's not like a idle curiosity. It's more like, wow, I have a big decision coming up. Like, let's talk about this, or something like that. That That's yeah. always a relief to me, because I do think, um, you know, curiosity is not a bad thing per se, but that it's not, I know so many people that are curious. There's just all of these kind of funny, funny ironies in life. Like uh, I heard from someone, you know, earlier this year and it really stuck with me. You should make the most money, get paid the highest for what comes easiest to you. And that was completely backwards from how I felt my entire life. Like I'm working so hard, I should get paid really more for this. Or, you know, this was easy for me. I'll give it away for free. No big deal. And she said, no, it's completely backwards. What's easiest for you may be the most valuable for others. And the fact it's easy is not a testament to how worthless it is. It's a testament to the effortlessness of something that you've truly mastered. So, so you're saying uh, I should get paid for incoherently rambling about esoteric absolutely it's it might be incoherent to you but i i guarantee that this is what people want and yeah. um, you know it's free no, for I, you it's valuable for them <laughs> no i i hear you about the um yeah the the curiosity thing like uh i think sometimes people i think curiosity is supremely important but people often give up agency and discernment and skepticism to be curious and treat them as somewhat opposite where I think like, you know, I mean, I'm like, even with all this Egypt stuff, um, and I'm going to be totally wrong about all of it, but 
uh, I try to be as really, uh, like, skeptical and doubtful, and I don't go into any, like, the ancient technology that they must have had from that, uh, you yeah. know, like, because maybe, I don't know, I don't, I don't know engineering and all that kind of stuff, but I know symbols, and I, under, you know, like, I, I can link it to things I've learned about myself through the Enneagram, and blah, 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 and then it's like, that language makes sense, so anyway, a lot of people will sometimes go, oh, well, if this one thing, like, like you know, uh, my understanding is human design was channeled, you know, so must be, or something along those lines, and so it must be yeah. everything channeled is, is whatever, and I, you know, whatever, I don't know. I, but I, ha I, like, even with yeah. human design, I don't know much about it, but things that, like, Lamar yeah. has told me has been useful, like that whole waiting for an invitation thing about being a projector. Uh, you know, it, maybe it's just enabling her very lazy friend, but uh, not just like putting the pressure off myself to be like promoting myself because it's so artificial yeah. when I do it and just waiting for people to to invite has been uh, pretty useful and pretty reliable thus far. Well, and even just noticing who recognizes you because that recognition, what they will recognize is that you have something that nobody else has. And... I hope it's not too presumptuous to say that in my experience of you, even just looking at your online output and, and doing what, what little, you know, uh, introductory research I, I did, um, I very much recognized here's someone who's doing something that nobody else on the planet is doing. And I think that that's what it is because there's misrecognition too, where someone kind of misrecognizes you and goes, oh yeah, here's someone who, who I can tell endlessly about my problems and ask for advice and then never do anything they say, right? That's not the kind right, of recognition right. you want or something, right? But but to actually recognize what's unique about your your contributions. Yeah, and um, human design, I mean, the, word, the term channeled, it kind of depends what we mean by that. Ra himself insisted that it was not channeled, that channeling mm -hmm. is different from what he had, but he did have an encounter with a disembodied voice that sounded like a 155-year-old woman chain-smoking cigars and essentially kind of communicated to him over eight days, during which he had such wild experiences as, I mean, human design was only like one day of it actually. He got the cosmic fairy tales of the Big Bang to our present time and all sorts of, and even into the future and all sorts of things. I mean, at one point he was taken to the mythical Shambhala. And I mean, I think like you, uh, I remain skeptical in this, since not that he had the experience, but skeptical of any interpretation that attempts to pin down something at a very concrete level. So like, yeah, talking about ancient aliens and things like that, I don't believe that in a physical, literal sense. I do, under, I do want to understand at what level we might understand that story that might be a, a better level than sort of a physical concrete level. Like even things like Atlantis, I, I have to wonder, um, maybe it was etheric in some sense. Uh, by, and by etheric, I simply mean not physical, not atomic, not part of atomic reality. I mean, we know uh, every few years, astrophysicists try to get rid of dark matter and dark energy and there's new headlines saying there's no such thing as dark matter and then lo and behold a year later it's back like we can't really get rid of it for the math to work it seems like only around six percent of the entire universe is atomic matter and that leaves a lot of room for how there may be a non-atomic yet still somehow real um part of reality that that we just don't understand that is accessible through dreams and visions and hallucinations and all sorts of things. So, you know, I, I'm very open on that. I, I definitely, you know, when people ask me about things like aliens, I say, well, I believe in alien encounters because an encounter is a psychological inner event similar to a drug trip, similar to an altered state of consciousness. People have encounters. They have encounters with Bigfoot. They have encounters with angels and demons and ghosts and all sorts of things. I mean, they have encounters with gods, but that encounter is an experience that they're having that we can analyze as an experience the same way you have a dream, the same way you have a vision, the same way. Um, but yeah, I, I have, 
I have these last couple of years kind of come back around to some of my earlier researches with, with fresh eyes, having, you know, we have to go through this kind of spiraling thing of like belief to disbelief to then going beyond belief or disbelief and just kind of saying, okay, these things happen and I don't know, and it's okay not to know. And I don't need to really believe or disbelieve. I can kind of just say, oh yeah, people have alien encounters. Do I think that there are aliens? No, I actually think it's a much more shocking and perhaps I think it's both more accurate and more shocking and maybe even just more interesting if we are the only um, self-reflected consciousness in, in the entire universe. And in fact, that's part of human design cosmology is that our solar system, human design is very human exceptionalist. Our solar system, according to the human design cosmology, which is really just not, it goes beyond human. I mean, it's just basically what, what Ra had in his encounter. Our solar system is completely unique in the entire universe as essentially operating as what could be called the third eye or the Ajna center of the universe. And so that's an interesting Earth. idea that just like, a, so basically for human design, the idea is that the, the universe is an unborn living entity. The entire thing is one entity, it's alive, and it's still in the womb. And then we have questions like, well, what'll happen when it's born? Well, I have no idea. But the idea here is that just like uh, a human body or an animal body doesn't have two centers of consciousness, it, but the whole thing is conscious, it only really has one center of self-reflected consciousness, self-aware awareness. Similarly, the whole universe is probably aware in some oblique way that we don't really know, some opaque way to us. It is aware, but it's not like there are aliens going, oh, this is an interesting podcast. Check out these two guys. You know, there, there's no, there's no, uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of an interesting idea. It's like we are in this, very special kind of exceptional part of the universe, which is the equivalent of like being a cell in the Ajna, in the, in the prefrontal cortex of, of the human or something like that. We're these little cells bouncing around in the center of self-reflected consciousness. So, you know, this is all stuff that's, that's highly impractical. It doesn't really have a lot of import, but it does at least to me seem like a more compelling story than there are thousands of alien civilizations who are just waiting to contact us. Like that doesn't even make sense to me. Like it actually, I, I like the idea of the universe just being vast expanses of empty space. And I like the idea that when people are talking to Pleiadians and Arcturians, they're just having some sort of dream vision encounter, but that it actually requires the biological body to experience that and that when we are disincarnate there is no self-reflected consciousness like to me it's actually comforting at first it was kind of lonely but then i i realized i like that story a lot better so i'm not going to i'm not going to die on that hill i'm not going to argue for that story that's just it's just a story that i like but that is one that uh that that is kind of endorsed by the messenger of the human design system Ra. yeah yeah yeah, well, we've gone far afield in our discussions. I, I know we didn't really discuss how much time we have today, but I want to be respectful of your time. My notes really included objective personality, um, Egypt, and uh, I guess one, one thing I'll say is I'm a big fan of your artwork. Have you been okay. painting your whole life? Is that something that you just naturally did or you've learned to do? Did you come to that later? Yeah, so I... Um... My dad is a political cartoonist, and my mom just paints and draws. And so uh, there are photos of me at the earliest possible age to have um, some kind of uh, dexterity. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drawing. And so I've just been drawing, like, incessantly uh, my whole life. I, you know, like in school, just continuously drawing to the point where you know teachers would try to get me to stop and then at some point they would just their spirit would break and just to let me draw because i would still pay attention um but yeah and then after uh after in college i started painting but i i went to i went to evergreen actually in olympia um my parents are from seattle so um i went to olympia and because i'm me instead of studying art 
I studied philosophy because I didn't want art. I didn't want the the art school to contaminate my whatever. So I'm self taught, and um, I started with watercolor and gouache simply because you can do it almost anywhere, uh, and didn't need a studio. But in the recent um, last couple of years, I've been teaching myself oil painting, which is a very slow process because it's just it's just a different medium. Um, but yes, yeah, so thank you. So and then my my baby sister, uh, you know, just she she just started oil painting and just killed it. And it's just an amazing oil painter. Her name is Lucy Lugovic. She just uh, yeah. just killed it. And so she's been helping me with like material questions about I'm like you know like Lulu like what do I do about I don't know uh, I wanted to like there's a painting over here that I wanted to like add texture to. And I didn't want to just use a bunch of my paints to waste it. And, and so Lulu direct, Lucy directed me to this, I can't even remember what it's called, but something to, you know, give it, give it body without wasting your paint. So it's been fun to connect with my sister that way. But yeah, I just, I've been always been painting and drawing and, um, the symbolic element of Egypt appeals to me because I'm a very, very, very visual thinker and, I've always just had this sort of uh oh cool yeah thank you that's of my girlfriend Alexandra, uh, you know she's very embarrassed about being naked there but uh, oh. <laughs> she uh but yeah so you know this sort of symbolic way and so it's been a yeah just a thing I've just always done I I have tons of just paintings that I just don't show anywhere and just do it for my own little narcissistic thing but you know I'm hoping maybe with now that I'm oil painting. And I have a sister that's getting into all these galleries that she can get me in. And I could be an older brother nepotism baby. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. We have a lot of galleries here as well. And I have I have a couple friends who do um, – my friend uh, Olivia Jane Christian and my other friend Seven, uh, Mar Mar uh, Marlena Seven Bremner. They're both oil painters. Well, they actually work in different media, but um, I guess – Seven mostly does oil painting, and it dries faster here in the high desert. So that is oh, <laughs> that's make it a little bit easier. But but they both um, incorporate Egyptian symbolism and kind of it does maybe lead credence to the to the idea that there's some Egyptian people reincarnating here or something like that. You know, <laughs> feels right at home. So, but yeah, I, I definitely um, really a, a, a appreciated your art and it. Uh, I didn't realize we had the, the Northwest connection there. I have a really good friend, Michael Steenbeck Litvin, who went to Evergreen, and I um, I used to go down to Olympia a lot. I had a girlfriend, Sabrina Monarch, down there um, for some time, and uh, would visit her and go to Psychic Sister and go to I, I don't know. There's a lot of fun places there, but um, I really like Olympia. Uh, yeah. I love the Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. A special yeah. place. Well, I will let you go, but I would love to have you back on the podcast anytime you want. I'm going to definitely check out your March event. And um, anytime you want to get away from New York and come visit the Southwest, you know, it, it snows, but it's sunny. So it's kind of like awesome. That'd be cool. Snowy and sunny here. And, uh, I have a big house. Uh, this, the house here we call the Center for Human Design. Uh, I actually got it on Google Maps as that, and it's just a big, a big, sprawling kind of rambler ranch house, cool. and uh, plenty of plenty of space, guest rooms. You can bring your your girlfriend, and maybe even put on an Enneagram class here or something like that. Uh, yeah. That'd be awesome. It'd be wonderful to have you. Yeah. Guys. And uh, after we hang up, if you send me your address, I can send you a copy of my book. I would love that. That would be, that would be incredible. I, I would, that would be, that will have a wonderful place on my shelf. Of, uh, so I've started, I have actually have one room here that I'm starting the Santa Fe human design library. And so we have a number of human design books, but then we also have related books and other mystical traditions, cool. alchemical books, things like that. And there even is a budding Enneagram section. So I would love to add well, it. Well, maybe I'll send you section. two, one for you and one for your, your human library, human design library. That would be incredible. That would be incredible, John. Well, um, so happy to have had you here. And so just to my listeners, make sure to check out uh, John's work, I guess, the Enneagram School, Big Hormone Podcast, um, your your book as well. Is that on, I guess, probably Amazon and all the normal places? Yeah, it's Instinctual uh, Drives and Enneagram, and it's on Amazon, but it's on any basically any online book 
bookstore you want to you know so if you're overseas and you don't have an amazon you, you, it should be in your country's online bookstore oh that's so exciting well thank you so much john it's been really lovely having thank you. you it was great meeting you it was great talking with you and i, I really appreciate it yeah.